either. But I do have some sort of an understanding, at least enough that I can speak about it, um, I believe. There is, we often find fault in, in Jacob. We hear that Jacob was a man that was crafty and he had a lot of issues back in the Bible, but we seldom hear that his opponent, if I can call him that, Esau, is, much, is mentioned much at all. And today I'd like to speak on the subject of Esau. Esau. And um, the subtitle under Esau is, it's kind of a grim title, but we need to hear it. When God hates. When God hates. You know, we live in a day today where we hear much of God's love and God loves, God is love. We know that, but we also find that there's some things that God hates. And Esau was one of those. When you hate something, you don't, uh, if I hate something, if I eat something that is not good and is uh, very distasteful, and even to the point where I learn to hate it, there are certain things perhaps that when we were young children we had to eat it because our moms and dads made us eat it. And we've learned to somewhat have a very strong distaste for it. And uh, the distaste is become something we hate. And there's one of the things that I could mention to you that would be something that I would hate. And it comes as a result of from uh, being a young boy. Years ago, I'm 60, almost 61 uh, now. And when I look at years ago, there was something that my mom did because we didn't have refrigerators and, and uh, freezers like we have today and fresh fruits out of the store was seldom found. And, but we saw something that uh, my mom used to buy some pineapple and she'd can them. And canned pineapple is something that I have learned to hate. I just simply do not like it. I love pineapple, but I cannot stand uh, canned pineapple. And so what I do, if, if there's anything that has canned pineapple in, I avoid the, all the food, even if it's mixed in it because I hate canned pineapple. Now, there's different descriptions of things that, that when we hate something, how it affects us. But I think you all know that if there's something that you have in your life or that you know of that you hate, it is something that you don't want to get close to. It is something that you will detour, detour around it. You will avoid it at all costs. And what we have here is uh, God actually said that he hated Esau. And to find why God would hate Esau, God of love, that can only love, but he's, it says in the Bible, we'll read it. What would a man or where would a man come to in his life that God would actually hate someone like that? What is the condition of a soul that the Lord would actually make a description like that? So I want to start and I with the first verse, I give a little bit of a background, understanding of who we really are, our spirit and how we work. It's found in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> the Lord layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Now that's not the whole verse. It's the last part of the verse. It's basically saying that the Lord is the one that formed the earth. And Another thing that he does is he formeth the spirit of man within him. We often think that God is the creator of the earth, and he certainly is, I believe, through his son. But then he also says, but there is something that he formed within us as human beings that he did. it. He formed a spirit within us. So we all have a spirit. Now, this is not speaking about the Holy Spirit. This is speaking about a spirit which we're made of, up of soul, body, and spirit. This spirit serves almost like an antenna. I'll, I've called it this way before. It serves almost like an antenna that receives the signals from God and from God's spirit. So when what happened in the, in the Garden of Eden is the spirit of man uh, was subdued by the soul of man when man turned to knowledge and reason to 
disobey God against his word and against what God asked him to do. Then the spirit of man became a non-function. It was like it turned into a dormant state. And as a result, the natural man cannot receive the things of God, of the spirit of God. Notice that. The, the antenna of the man came to a place where it became dormant and wouldn't receive the signals that came or the, the words that came from the Holy Spirit. So the words that comes from the Holy Spirit minister to our spirit. And we want to explain that a little bit because I see this is the problem that Esau had. Um, so when you can look at yourselves as a person that before you were born again, you were in a dormant state where you could not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They didn't make sense to you. And it is sad to say that even in the day that we have professed born-again people, for some reason there is a deep quenching that goes on where there's people that also cannot receive of the Holy Spirit. And it is because once you're born again, it doesn't mean that you will be a spiritual person. It is often that way, and it should always be that way. But there's people that will still go back and lean on the own understanding the way Adam and Eve did. And when they lean on the understanding of Adam and Eve, what happens is, is the reason of themselves, their own reasoning power, again, springs into being and overrules that antenna spirit of man. And therefore, man will not be able to receive again from the Spirit of God. And a lot of Christians, so-called, walk right on, don't know the difference. That's why it doesn't mean a whole lot when you hear the, uh, the voice of the Spirit. The importance is the voice, not the word of what the Spirit says, but the voice of the Spirit. We should be able to discern the voice of the Spirit. And if our spirit is clean and in good function or in perfect function, we will receive of the Spirit of God. When our spirit is not in perfect function with God, polluted with sin, or could be um, other types of things that have entered into the heart of man, will make bring a man to a place of dormancy again, and man then starts imagination, uh, imagining. And he starts imagining that God spoke to him, and God says things to him, but they're polluted. They're, they do not come with the voice of the Spirit. Now, let's go on here. Proverbs 20, verse 27. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the invert parts of the belly. So the function of the spirit of man is also as a candle. So if we put the lights out completely in this building and somebody brings in a little candle, that candle lights up every spot where it goes to. The spirit of man is the candle of God. In other words, when this spirit that is within us, not the Holy Spirit, our own spirit, we're made of soul, body, and spirit, when our spirit is in, is, has been restored and in, been in function with God, it receives the things of God, but it illuminates also the things that God speaks to that person. So what it is, is extremely important that our spirit is always in tune with what God is asking us to, to be. That means if you have sin in your life, it needs to be repented of. It goes to biases and things of this nature, religion, things of this nature, preferences. Those can all have an effect on our spirit. And then what happens, next thing you know, you're walking in darkness, and the Spirit of God is not lighting anything in you because the Spirit of God is the one that lights the candle. He is the one, he's the fire of that candle that we have. I'll read it again. The Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord doesn't say the fire of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is described as a fire. And so the Holy Spirit lights the candle of our spirit and brings us light. Then we, then we can spiritually see things. This is the problem that Esau had. He could not see spiritual things. In John chapter 7, verse 38, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This again is a description of believing as the scriptures say. If we believe something different than what the Bible says, if the Bible says one thing and we believe another thing, it is quite obvious that the, whatever comes out of that belly will not be rivers of living water. Not, probably not even a little stream. But here it says it will be rivers of living water. 
Now, I, I'm just laying some foundation. In Ecclesiastes 3, verse 21, it says, Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? The spirit of man goes upwards. The spirit of the beast goes downwards. So the Bible is quite clear about this. The spirit of man picks up the things of the spirit of God. And that's always upward. It's not downward. But the spirit of the beast, or they who mind earthly things, that's the spirit of the beast. Notice the difference. What you're conscious of, if, whether you're God conscious or the way, when you're world conscious, or conscious about people around you. The spirit that goes upward is always God conscious, and that's the restored spirit. The spirit that is down does not receive the things of God, doesn't reason at all, even with the things of God, but has his own reason of believing and, and picking up things with own personalized descriptions and so forth. So when we mind earthly things, we can know that our mind or our spirit has somewhat need of restoration. Now I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. So we notice here a condition. If we love God, it sets us in a different category. Now there's people that have make descriptions of loving God, maybe by the way they dress, or maybe the things that are said. But according to this, it's not what it's speaking about. There's something to love God, and there's something to act as though we love God. And see, this is where the spirit of man will never lie to you. The spirit of man is the one that searches deep in the heart of man, and he understands the man more than even our mind does. I believe that. I believe my spirit and your spirit, once restored by the blessing of Jesus, the blood, the forgiveness of the blood of Jesus Christ, and the reception of the Holy Spirit within. I'm not speaking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit here. I'm speaking about receiving the Holy Spirit. That puts the light on the candle. Now, what happens then is it says, but as it is written, eye has not seen, ear has not heard. So there is nothing that I can tell you, there is nothing that you can see that can enter into your heart to give you an idea of the things that God has prepared for you if you love Him. Now, I believe that is talking about in this world. It's not in the next world. That is in this world. It's not speaking about heaven. I've got many reasons uh, to say that because the following verse says, but He has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Now, this is the difference between Esau and Jacob. Esau went by what he saw. He went by what he felt. And he did great things. In fact, Esau did much greater things than Jacob in the eyes of man. And we'll get to that in a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's read this again. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward? Uh, I'm sorry, it's 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Now verse 10 says, But God hath revealed them unto us. How? By the Holy Spirit. Did you hear that? It's not by what you glean from somebody else's writings, what you glean from my speaking to you. It's not that. Because it cannot be read with the eye, it cannot be heard with the ear. It has to be received by the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that? That is, has to be very clear. Because what God wants to do, He wants to teach us the deeper ways of God. He wants to teach us and take us much further than most people ever walk. And be very honest with you, that's totally my understanding. Because many people will not get this far in their Christian experience because it gets offensive when God reveals some things that are much deeper. But this is the power of the Holy Spirit. He wants to take us deeper. So I'll read again. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, 
neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now, before I read the next verse, let's understand this. One of the things that the Holy Spirit does, probably one of the descriptions you see over and over is he is a searcher. He is a searcher. He's like a current of air, but he searches and he searches and he, and he searches and he searches and he has an understanding. My spirit has an understanding of things that I probably do not have an understanding of. Um, actually, I know that. Because my spirit knows more about me than I do. Now, now, you say like this, how do you say that? That sounds somewhat confusing. Well, let's continue to read some of these verses and you, maybe you'll get an understanding of this. See, the spirit of man is the one that searches the deep things within the heart. And it goes into, even into the belly. And it finds exactly the understanding and the evaluation and takes the total inventory of the human being. And then the Holy Spirit does the same, but he does that about God. The Holy Spirit is the one that searches out God and searches out his word. And he knows things about God. And so between those two spirits, the spirit of man and the Holy Spirit, there is then the communication. This is why I often find that when a person receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit, often there is weeping, often there is deep healing, often there is things that take, transpire that that person will never ever have a problem with again because he was baptized by the Holy Spirit in his spirit. Now, <coughs> excuse me, let's look at the next verse. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man? That says simply this, that there is no man that knoweth the things of a man like the spirit of man. For what man knoweth the things of a man, with the exception, the spirit of man, which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. So there is something, the communicator, the spirit of God, that has an understanding of God, like my spirit has an understanding of me, and those two come together, there is a sense of excitement, and there's a tremendous balance of truth that will transpire from that. Verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Now, it's not talking about the Holy Spirit. Remember this, the capital S and the word spirit is often, almost every time, ref referring to a person with a capital S. Okay, so this is speaking about us or our spirit, which our spirit is not a person. It's part of us as a person. So he says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Here is the problem. We talk about faith, we talk about believing God, and people have a big difficulty believing that and, and walking in the truth of that. The whole children of Israel struggled for 40 years trying to find and believe God. The problem was they had an antenna problem. They had a spirit problem, their own spirit, which that was in the old covenant, somewhat different. They were led in a different way than we are today. But here it says, now we have received not the spirit of the world. So if you have the spirit of the world, you will not go deeper with God. But the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us. And I speak about that as birthright. There's things that are in salvation that God has freely given to us. It's the argument that some people will carry well, God is, will not heal today because not everybody gets healed and it wouldn't be fair. It's not about fair. It's about knowing what, re, what belongs to us. And when our spirit is restored and receives the things of the Spirit of God, we will find these things that belong to us. But there's many people that will never go there because their spirit, often it's the spirit of the world that they have. And the spirit of the world is the things that have to do with our senses and our reason, our own reasoning powers. When I reason that God somehow does not heal today because of 
That went out with the apostles, like some would argue. That tells me of another problem. It does not tell me that they don't understand the argument. It tells me that they have an antenna problem. And because they're not receiving from the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God knows the deep things of God, and He'll reveal them us to us, and then He will show us the things that belong to us. Now that to me is extremely important in the Christian life. If I go through life never knowing what really belongs to me by way of the promises of God, I will almost have, never have a promise that I can even receive when I understand that my growth in the Christian life is all based on the promises of God. They're all in Him, yes and amen. So the promises all belong to me. That includes healing. It includes the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All those things that are in the Bible, those are freely given to us. But when we have the spirit of the world, we will never see this. And as a result, it can make you feel, uh, it can even intimidate you that you will say that, well, God just doesn't love me like he loves someone else. Look at the problem here. It's very clear. Let's read it again. Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. We have speak to the extremes, and I'm not trying to do that. There's a balance in everything. Now, the next verse is verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. The Holy Spirit is the teacher here, not man's wisdom. Man's wisdom and the things that you have concerning your own wisdom will not teach you these things. This is the Holy Spirit that teaches these things. Now, the, the last verse in this 1 Corinthians 2 that I will read today is verse 14. But the natural, which interprets as soulish, it's the same word, but the natural or soulish man, not the spiritual man, the one with the antenna, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Our soul will not discern spiritual things. All right? If your soul is stirred up about something, it will immediately stop receiving the things of God. If your soul is what reads your Bible, 
if your soul, that's the emotion, will, and intellect, if that is what reads your Bible, that is what tries to walk with God, that is what tries to interpret the Bible, you'll never get anywhere in the Christian life, really. The Spirit of God is the one that has to teach us these things. But the natural man or the soulish man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. It says, a man that sees the spiritual things, or if he hears about the things that be of God, the spiritual things, he says, it's a bunch of foolishness. I've had people say that right to my face. It's a bunch of foolishness. You know why? I can't argue with them concerning the foolishness because that's the way they understand. But when the Holy, what it speaks about further though is that the Holy Spirit is missing in their life. Now, maybe they have the Holy Spirit in their heart, maybe so, but the antenna has been polluted by something wrong. Can be, a, like I said, a bias, a sin, things like this that will cut off your connection between you and your God. <coughs> Excuse me. The things that come from God can only be, be spiritually discerned. Now, so we understand that the communication between God and man is spiritual. It's a spiritual way of doing, all right? It's not my voice speaks to him, now his voice speaks back to me. And I say, God, I want this, or God, will you help me understand this? And then he'll respond right back to me and says, yes. Sit down and I'll teach you how to do this. It's not that way. He does not speak to us in these audible voices. I'm not saying that he can. not He has in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, he speaks to us through his Spirit. All right? And this is what's so important to understand because there's people that say that, well, I've never really heard anything from God in, from the Holy Spirit. The problem is not the Holy Spirit. The problem is the communication that you have as your spirit with the Holy Spirit. There's something clenching the Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible says, quench not the Holy Spirit. Because if you quench Him, you won't hear from Him. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Because if you grieve Him, you will not hear from Him. And if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you'll never hear from Him. So it's a sensitive condition that God is asking us to walk in. And there's so many elements around us that want to control this communication. And so this is why the blood of Jesus Christ needs to continually clean and cleanse us so that our antennas, our, our, our spirit would be open in communication that the light and fire of God's spirit would have a light as a candle is lit in my life. Now, I want to talk about Jacob and Esau. Did you notice they were already fighting in the womb? They were conceived as twins. There were two boys in the womb of a mother, and they were already fighting before they knew words. How is this? One has a spirit, and the other one has a spirit. Now, according to as we read, those spirits were basically neutralized because of the sin in the garden where all that man wants to receive and can receive before he is born again is carnal things. He can sense a drawing from God. He can sense God's love. But he will not receive the things of God because they are spiritually discerned at this point. They are not spiritual yet. That has to happen when a man becomes born again. Then a man has the ability to become spiritual. Now, does it mean that he is immediately spiritual? I believe I believe I would say yes. But so often people walk away from that truth and they again go back and so often their lives do not stay clean and cleansed and they start falling back into things and their, their life becomes, or their spirit man becomes deteriorated to the point where he cannot continue to receive the things of God. Let's look at this verse. Why would God say that he hated Esau why would God say that? And it has a thing to do with what I just told you. I looked at the life of Esau, and, and I, I just, what is so different and difficult about this man that somehow Esau was hated by God? Now, I know some people try to dim that word hated, 
and just saying love less. But it simply says that, that God hated Esau. Now, I don't know with the same hate of, of what he had towards generations that walked away from God. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that there is a verse which I read, uh, which I also read, that God hated Esau. And it's a strange verse to many because we are in a day that everybody says God loves and God loves and God loves. Well, God does love, absolutely. God is love. That is God. And, but somehow he found this man that he could not love. And this is my subject. Genesis chapter 25 or 34. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is one of the first areas that I find that Esau had something really wrong with him, besides the fighting that they were fighting when they were in the womb of the mother. That I do not understand. But God had a specific purpose in these two boys. One was different than the other. But it is interesting as we see this, where it says Esau despised his birthright means Esau dis esteemed his birthright. He considered his birthright of being really not a big deal. Now, I have talked to you down through the years here, and I have spoken to you and, and here about two years ago. I said, consider one phrase, your birthright. Give that some thought. What is your birthright? We're not talking about the new birthright. Being born again, having a new birthright. There's things that the new birth offers that we have rights to. If not, nobody's going to heaven. We all understand that one. We say, well, okay, I don't really believe that the new birth would give me any rights to anything really, Wayne, but we all expect after we're born again, we'll go to heaven. That's a right. There's other rights. There's a lot of rights in this world of blessings and things that God has paid for through Jesus Christ, like healing. By his stripes ye were healed. It's past tense. Now, one of, like I said in the first part of this message, one will say, well, I don't believe that way because not everyone gets healed, so we should throw it away completely. It doesn't change the fact. It doesn't change the Bible. But it might change the way it appears to you because you're, you are of a different persuasion. And when your persuasion is not according to the Word of God, you will not receive healing. It's just the way it is. If I come to Jesus and I doubt whether He paid the price for my healing, this is in First Peter, I believe, by His stripes ye were healed. It's past tense. It is a past tense situation that I'm healed based on the stripes that He had in Pilate's court. They, they, they beat him up. They beat him up. There was blood running from him. They could trace him all the way from Gethsemane all the way to the cross because there was blood drops. His garments were soaked with blood. Why? In that is where he healed me. Now, some of you might have a problem with that. You might say, well, I agree with it. I see it. It's in the Bible, but it doesn't work that way. These are the way some people receive things wrong. You might be receiving it by your own idea. You might be receiving this by, by common reason. It's not going to work. It has to be by the Spirit of God that speaks to your antenna, which is the Spirit of man. Esau somehow despised his birthright. Now, I have noticed this already in... Uh, in years gone by, when I have spoken about the promises of God, I could see it in people's faces. There was a disdain to some people. It's like, why are you talking about this? This is, it's like not a big deal. It's like, it doesn't belong to me, or I don't agree with that. This is how Esau looked at it. Esau looked at his birthright, which he had more rights than Jacob had. There was a lot of good things in the birthright. He had a lot of things going for him. But he looked at a little cup of soup and he said, you know, a little morsel of meat, a little piece of meat to me is more important than all the blessings and promises 
that God has given me through being the oldest son as, Jake, or as Isa, Isaac's son. And so he counted it as really not worth a whole lot. My challenge to you this morning is all the things that are written in this Bible, they're written in here. They're the promises of God. Do you esteem them? Do you esteem the promises of God? Or do you write them off and say that they're not really important to you? I can well survive without the promises of God. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is one of those things. I can well, I've learned well to walk without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've learned well to walk without even the communication of the Holy Spirit. I've learned well to walk without being healed. Those are birthrights. Esau didn't esteem his birthright. And I, I just want to bring this as a challenge, and I hope you receive it correctly, a challenge that these are riches, tremendous riches of God's truth that he has paid for in the blood of Jesus. And he allowed it to come forth in the upper room and has given it to man freely, the things that come from God. But we don't esteem them is often the reason we don't walk in them. We think of it as not being that necessary. It's just not that necessary to have all this. Not only that, there's people that will argue against and say that it is not for today. This is the life that Esau had. Esau saw some things and he said, I have more important things to do. Esau was a big businessman. Esau established eight kingdoms that he had established eight successful kings that he had put in place before Jacob or before Israel had one king. He built cities. He did things in, if you go to Petra in Edom, where the Edomites come from. Esau did a lot of great things, while Jacob did almost nothing. He seemingly, Jacob tried his best to do some things, and he got a lot of things wrong. But Esau went and did many things wrong over and over and over. But he was very successful. But when he came down to a certain point in his life, he saw that what he did was nothing, that he needs something he can't get. And he remembered what he forfeited, what he gave away from, through a little parcel of meat. Now he saw that the end of life is where I need all of this and I don't have anything. Because he did not esteem his birthright. I really want to warn you on this. I really want to warn you on this. There's a lot of churches that do not teach this, but you've heard it. You've heard this about the birthright and what God has prepared for them that love him. Eye is not seen, ear is not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. There is so much more that God has prepared and done and wants you to walk in it in a deeper sense, in a deeper form. But you don't esteem it. And one day will come when you really need it and you can't find it. Now, I'm not saying that in a personal way, but I'm saying that that is what happened with Esau. For some reason, God saw something about this man, Esau, that he simply did not like. He did not like that Esau would not esteem his birthright. The things that were freely given to him, that were right there for his taking. He said, I've got more important things. It's a bunch of hogwash in our, in our day. These are things that are not necessary. And there's many Christians that walk in this life not having a deeper understanding of what their birthright things are. And think it also that's not necessary. Let me just say this. In the spiritual world we're living in, the day will come when we all need to have what God has given us our birthright. I believe that is what calls us as an successful Christian. A successful Christian to me is not a man that does a lot of things like Esau did. A successful Christian to me is one that is able to receive what God has prepared for him. It might not be a whole lot. And in Jacob's life, all it was at the end was leaning on a stick, worshiping God. And he was put in the Hebrews in, the, in, that, in, those, uh, in that chapter of faith that so few people have ever made it in, he was put in there because he leaned on a stick worshiping God. 
What an amazing statement. It is often those big things that people are wanting to do and, and feel so like maybe Esau did. Esau was busy. He decided, I'm not going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to go out and do my things anyways. And he did. He did a lot of things. But there came a time when he needed the birthright. It was gone. And it says he cried with tears. He cried bitterly, trying to find and come back that God would bless him, but he never found it. You know why? God hated the way he lived. God did not like the way he lived. He lived a life of self. He lived a life that was all about himself. He was out always wanting to kill Jacob. He made that statement in the beginning days of his life. One day I'm going to get that man. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to hurt him. I'm going to destroy him. Because he was jealous. Let's look at some other things here. Esau was smart made many smart decisions according to human reason. I just wrote some things down. And in Genesis 36, Esau had eight successful kings before Israel had any. His kingdom flourished as the Edomites and Seir. Now Jacob, while Jacob was home, not doing much, but had greater promises, and Jesus came through his lineage. It might have been that Jacob had no real greater purpose in life. Do you hear me? No real greater purpose in life than to simply be the lineage man where Jesus would come through. That might have been his purpose. Do you hear me? He didn't do a whole lot more than that. He birthed a child, and through that child was the lineage where Jesus came through. And if his pattern, what he was called to do, was only to be a man that carries in through that lineage of the coming Messiah, the Savior, that might be, have been his calling. I don't know. But at the end, he leaned on a stick and he worshipped God. And God said, one of the greatest men of faith. I cannot even say, I have to say wow on that. How many times do we miss this? We look for things and cities to build and things to do like this to get put a lot of action in when maybe God is all he's asking is that we would allow Jesus to be at birth with us, to be in our heart, to let love come, to let certain things come. Might not be anything big. Maybe just leaning on a stick. Herod the Great was a descendant of Edom, one of the greatest kings known, known as Herod the Great. He came through the lineage of Esau. And he was, of course, the man that stood against Jesus when he was a young boy and demanded that all boys under a certain age will have to be killed. He wanted Jesus dead. That came from Esau. The spirit, that spirit will do that. He was a person of much success in the natural eye, but he had a problem, and it was a big one that caught up with him because the day came when he needed God, but he couldn't find him. He cried, he wept, he did everything he could, and he sought it carefully. That means he did everything that he knew to do to find God's acceptance, and God said, no. Now I look to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, looking diligently, diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest the root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. This was the problem with Esau. Of all the things that I looked at in Esau's life, I basically came to one, one thing that I could find. Only one thing that I could put my finger on it. Here is something he had in his life. He had a root of bitterness. Somehow he got offended in Jacob. He got offended in him. But it was his own fault. He was hungry at that time. Was it a weak spot, weak time in his life? And he sold his birthright. Look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. The word grace of God simply here means divine. Um, I wrote it down somewhere here, I believe. Uh, divine influence upon the heart. The divine influence that God had placed upon 
the heart. He violated that. Let's allow that to speak to us. God gives us grace. God gives us mercy. God gives us pardon. God has shown love to us. Even before we could love him, he loved us. As a result, now we love him. But what Esau did is he failed that grace that was put upon him by God. God had given him divine influence, I believe, through the birthright. That was a divine influence. It came down from the law. But he failed that one, failing the grace of God. I would like to just speak to you for a moment in that. Look at your life and see where did you find and where do you find that God has put divine influence upon your life. Divine influence by way of salvation. You've been born again. You've been washed. Your sins have been forgiven. That's divine influence. God has given you power over sin. God, God has given you power over things. That's divine influence. Anything that God has blessed you with is divine influence. Esau failed that one. Esau took it for granted that that's not that important. The divine influence upon his heart, the things that God has done in his life are no big deal. And he was looking to do greater things than the divine influence upon his heart would allow him to do. Because the divine influence upon his heart was not asking for him to go and build cities and establish kingdoms and to do many, many things that he did, very successful. That's not what the divine influence was given to him for. He gave it away, and then he went and did this. <coughs> Excuse me. I guess what I would like to say, I would much rather do one little thing under the divine influence of God, it's grace upon my life, than do a thousand things without the divine influence. And what I'm wanting to tell you today is, you need to look at where God has put divine influence on your life and make the best out of that. Take that and walk with it. Allow that to be a part of your ministry, of your mission. The divine influence that God has placed upon, upon Esau was by way of birthright. It's very obvious, the only thing. The divine influence that God has placed on us is also by way of birthright. What have I done with that? With the divine influence that God has placed on my life, what have I done with that? Am I unsatisfied if I cannot be a mover of mountains because somebody else could? Does it affect me then that I think I have to outdo someone else? What you'll do is you'll give your birthright away. You need to look very intensely into your life and see where God has appreciated you and gave you blessing and life and influenced it with his divine power and walk in that. That might be all that you'll ever do. You look at the great man Jacob. Let, let me not turn away from this. This great man Jacob that seemed to be mostly a failure all through his life did one major thing. He gave birth to someone whom Jesus came through as a lineage. Might have been his only purpose. I don't know. But then after that, you know, all the sons that he had and so forth, <clears throat> you know the twins, he couldn't have children, and then they had these twins. <clears throat> I'm talking about Isaac. That's how Jacob came into the scene. You look at the influence that was upon that man Jacob, and, and it just, it, when we look at it, it seems that Jacob was an absolute failure in his entire life. Now tell me, if that reason is what is reasonable to think, why? Why in the world would God allow his name to be in Hebrews in the Hall of Faith? If Jacob was that big a failure, why was he put into that chapter where so few of them went in? Because he was a man of faith. And his birthright came to him at the end. 
Just before he died, his birthright cost him to lean on a stick worshiping God. That's what it did. Esau didn't have a stick to lean on, and he couldn't worship God. You see, the natural reasoning of man can come up with all kinds of programs and ideas and ways to get ourselves busy in the kingdom, or you feel guilt. That's not the antenna that has been resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit. God will never force you to do anything. He will lead you to do things. Always remember that. He will not force you to do things. If you are under that pressure that you've got to do something, you've got to do it's not God. God will lead you. They that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We're led by the Spirit. We're not pushed by Him. We're led by the Spirit of God. The difference between Esau and Jacob. Hebrews, I want to look at this again a little bit and then I'll go on. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. What this root of bitterness does, it rules a person. And then what happens, it defiles many people. I've seen this already in people where I've, I could even see it in their faces that they have a root of bitterness in them. As I was dealing with them, finding that they had a root of bitterness, something that made them bitter, that they're carrying with them, and it will rule them because those roots grow and they will leave effect on other people and defile many people. That was Esau, verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Verse 17, for ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He felt that his birthright was so what? He failed God's divine influence upon the heart, he had a root of bitterness springing up, and it troubled him in his entire life. That root defiled multitudes and thousands of the Edomites and actually became enemies to Israelites because of that root of bitterness. Esau was a spiritual prostitute. He could be bought out and influenced. He was called a profane person. He was called a fornicator, which is a spiritual prostitute. He can be bought out. He could have had a heavenly inheritance, but was rejected by God. He sought it carefully with tears, but never found true life changing repentance. And I'm just reading a couple of my notes. True repentance is a change of mind and heart and feet. It's the placement of which way you're walking. It's where your mind is thinking and not thinking that way anymore. It's a total change of heart, mind, and your feet. In Romans chapter 9, Paul tries to uh, to explain some of this to the Italians. Romans chapter 9, verse 8. That is, they which are the children of the flesh are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Now he goes back and he uses this as the example of Isaac. See, Isaac was the product of a miracle. It was Abraham that, Abraham that believed that God will give him a son. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He believed God. In that believing him, he knew God promised him that was a birthright. So uh, uh, Abraham could have said, well, it's no big deal. Other people have had promises too. Other people heard stuff too. But Abraham knew that God promised. He knew the voice of God, and God spoke to him and said, you will have a son. Well, it was 99 years old, and he still didn't have a son. It does not cause the promise or the birthright, I call it the birthright, that he had, that God gave him. It does not cause that to diminish in any form or way. That promise was a strong at 99, as it was the day it was given him first. But he could have said, it's not important. That's what Esau did. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And the children of the promise was Isaac. 
Isaac was the product that was promised. And so the promise is in Isaac. And in Isaac shall thy seed be called. The children of promise are the seeds. Verse 9, for this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. The promise was that God said, Abraham, you can try as often as you want to, but until I come on the scene, it will not happen. And then he says here, at this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. The frustrating years of Abram must have been phenomenal experience, knowing that God spoke to him and said, you will have a son, but he couldn't, but he couldn't. And even proved that the age that he has and his wife had, it is impossible. The problem was God wasn't on the scene yet. But when God came on the scene, and God will come on the scene if you believe. It's the difference between Esau. God couldn't come on the scene because he gave his birthright. All the things that were promised to him were not important to him. Are you getting this? This is really important. If you want to go further in your Christian walk, and if you wonder why things have been stale in your life for so long, you have a birthright. Verse 10, And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. Verse 11, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. What he's saying here, we had two children in the body of a woman. She was pregnant with two children, and they were already fighting inside, and it was because of design by God. That to me is a fearful thing, that God allowed this and he made them and he predestinated them to do exactly that. It's a fearful thing. I'll read it again so that you understand. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any e good or evil. It's not that the one did, Esau did something bad in the womb. No, they haven't done anything evil. That the purpose of God according to the election might stand not of works, but of him that calleth or promises. Verse 13, and it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What has Esau done then that God could say, I hated Esau? What has Jacob done? Jacob hasn't done a whole lot of different things. He tried like everything to make the promises of God work in him by being crafty, by setting up things so that the promises would start working. He was trying to help God do his things. Esau didn't even go there. Verse 15, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on him or on whom I will have compassion. God says, I will have mercy on you, I will have compassion on you, and I will make the decision who gets that. Now, I would like to say this, that if you're sitting under the sound of my voice today, and God's compassion and mercy have, has come to you, you cannot let that thing go. You've got to prize that. That is really, really special. Esau didn't have that. God, when he has compassion on you and he has mercy on you, don't you dare splurge that. I, I don't know how else to say this. This is very serious business. I don't understand the making of it, but I know it says that way here. And most of you, and I think probably all of you that are sitting here today have had God's compassion on you. That's why you're sitting here today. You've had forgiveness. He had compassion on you, and He forgave you for your sins. He redeemed you from the sins and garbage that you were in, and He's given you mercy. Don't you mess with that. 
Don't sell it. Don't fornicate with it. Don't let anything buy it out. Count it as a birthright. Verse 16. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. You can will as hard as you want to. You can run as hard as you want to. It's not in that. It's in God that shows mercy. Verse 17. For the scripture says unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. And it looks like it wasn't fair that God heartened Pharaoh's heart so many times. It was just not fair. You know what? God's not fair. He's just. God is not a fair God. You will not all be treated alike. He has more grace on some, more compassion on others. We, that's not in our charge. It's not in our control. But when he has given us mercy and compassion, value that and value highly. And don't you ever sell that. Don't you ever sell that. Hang on to it. Because it restores the soul. 18. Therefore has he mercy on whom he has mercy, and on whom he will he hearteneth. I don't understand all that. I'm not a person that believes in predestination by the way of people make no, have no choices. I don't believe that's what it's speaking about. Because it's not his will that any be lost. Malachi chapter 1 verse 3, And I hated Esau, and I laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. This is what he did. He said, I hated Esau, and I laid his mountains, which means the works that he did, the big things that he created, the success that he was, and then also his heritage, the things that belonged to him. He says, he laid them as waste for the dragons, which is the demon world, and in the wilderness. He took that which belonged to Esau, the good things that God had planned for Esau, he took them and put them out on the edge where the demons could just come in or in the, 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 the demonic world could come in and just ravish the thing, destroy it and tear it up and waste the whole thing. Because he hated Esau. How can God hate Esau? There was a root of bitterness in Esau. Hosea, chapter 12, verse 2. The Lord has also a controversy with Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways, according to his doings will he recompense him. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had made power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel. And there he spake with him. Even the Lord of hosts, the Lord, is his memorial. It says here, the Lord had controversy with Judah, and he punished Jacob according to his ways. He took his brother by the heel in the womb. Was there something in that? I don't know. Was there a sense already when Jacob took Esau, by the heel in the womb that an anger stirred up within. I don't know. But one thing I do know, Jacob or Esau had a root of bitterness. There was a root of bitterness in Esau that couldn't be repented of. He tried, he tried to repent that God would put his blessing on it, but he couldn't. Somewhere it went too far. I believe all the efforts... Personally, I believe all the efforts and all the energy and all the things that Esau tried to do to maybe prove himself greater than Jacob or maybe even prove that he does not need a God like Jacob. All the things that he armed, strong-armed himself to become to prove to ever or whoever, maybe even to himself, that was part of the problem, if not all of the problem, of a root of bitterness. A root of a mishap that happened to him where he 
started discounting what God meant to his life. Now let me say this, that brothers and sisters today, we have things that happen to us at times that are trials, that are hardships, things that will, would like us to discount who God is. You can buy it at a store. You can buy it at a village. You can buy it at a church. You can buy it at a, in a family. Something that would discount what God should mean to you. This is exactly what happened to Esau. There was a lot of things that he discounted for what somehow this isn't the big deal. The voice of God, the strength of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, the love of God, all these things are not that big a deal. It's probably the voice that continued to speak to Esau. And it took valuation of preciousness that God had given to him that belonged to them and it discounted that to where it's not that big a deal. So what is the love of God anyways? You see, when you go through hard times and difficult times, it brings us at times to places where we question if God really cares, does God really love? Is grace such a big deal? Can I live without even the mercy of God? Do I even need God on a daily basis? Things that want us to discount God or to fornicate. These are, this is what happens in the believer's heart. And this is what happened to Esau, I believe. There were things offered to him. His birthright looked like it's not important at all. Why do I need God's blessing when I can do it all myself? I believe that one there is a very popular one. I've learned to work. I've learned to work hard. I've learned to do things right. Why do I yet need God's blessing? You're on very dangerous soil. Because I will tell you the day will come when the blessing of God is the only thing that will sustain you and will hold you. When everything falls apart around you, and it can, and it probably will if you've trusted in it. This I find so dangerous. It is part of why I believe God hated Esau. Because Esau was at a place where he really did not need God. And I would like to say this to some of you younger business people that are here. You, you learn something, and you learn to do it well, and it seems that you're busy, and you make a lot of money, and you just all at once, you've got, kind of got it together. I want to warn you. You will need the blessing of God sooner or later. Just because you can do something really well, doesn't mean you have the blessing of God. Once you know whether you have the blessing of God is if you know that you need the blessing of God. There's a lot of people that do things so well they don't need the blessing of God. They don't even think about it. They don't even ask God for prayer or, or pray to God and say, God, I need your blessing because they do things so well. If God loves you, he will challenge that one day. Because he loves, we read a lot about the love of God. He loves, he loves. But one of the things that I have that we know is evidence that God loves us is if he chastens us. That we often don't hear about it. I just want you to know it's so important. I'm a businessman. You know that. I'm a businessman. I have numerous businesses. And... I depend constantly on the blessing of God. Constantly is my prayer for God's blessing. God's blessing. Because I cannot go without the blessing of God. So my dependence is totally on the birthright blessing of God. And I just want to warn you, when you're young and you have a lot of heart to work and have vision to do something and you go about it, that's what Esau did. Esau did not need the blessing of God. He could build cities without it. 
But it was at the end where he saw that he needed the blessing of God when the whole world came down on him. He needed the blessing of God. He couldn't find it. He tried to repent. He cried. He sought it carefully with tears. He probably went back and identified every little obstacle in his entire life to see where he went wrong, but he couldn't find the spot. And God's blessing would not return to him. He couldn't even repent. He tried to say, I'm sorry. He tried to say, God, I... Can I do it over again? He tried all those things, but he could not repent. His feet wouldn't turn, his mind wouldn't change, and his heart stayed sane. <clears throat> I have a message that I preached some years ago on the hardened heart. That's what a hardened heart is. A hardened heart is when the heart cries out to God, and it can cry, but nothing changes. It comes from having tried to repent too many times. You've asked the Lord over and over for forgiveness, and finally you neglect, and you become hardened in your heart. And then finally you try to ask God, God, forgive me, please. Lord, help me, forgive me. But your feet go right on and your mind goes right on and your heart stays unchanged. That's a hardened heart. That is obviously what Esau had. But that God would bring it, I understand this was in the Old Testament, but that God would bring it so to the point where he classified that as a person that I hate? It is beyond my understanding. I cannot understand that. That God has so much love. A person that wanted to come to him and wanted to repent but couldn't. And God says, I hated Esau. I think it's the mentality of trying to do those things without God. To take your hands off of the arms of God and do it yourself. That I don't need God. Those types of thoughts that go through the minds of the people. I want to conclude this message. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto, babes in, uh, as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet are you now able. I believe the difference between Jacob and Esau was a carnal and a spiritual person. A carnal person well, at the end of this message today, say there's a bunch of nonsense. doesn't make sense to me. And I will confirm that was the word of God. The Bible says it won't. It sounds like foolishness. That's what the Bible says. I read that verse in the beginning. Because the carnal mind cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are not discerned with the natural mind. They're received by the Spirit, our Spirit, that picks that up and teaches us the deeper ways of God. You know, some of you people have been struggling for some years on the same issues. It's time to be out of that. That's part of this, I've fed you with milk. You've been struggling with the same issues for many years, and nothing changed. It's time to go beyond that. It's time to look at the birthright that is given you. It is time to take an examination of your own life and see, God, where am I missing it? It's time to get serious with God. God, where am I missing this? And this happens to all of us. It happens to me. We go through life. We have a great victory that we win. A beautiful blessing that comes. And we walk in victory for a while. And all at once we start slipping back a little bit. But not, not a whole lot. Just a little bit. And the next thing you know, after some years, you're right back in the same track. God is wanting to teach us to go further and to come out of that baby stage and to become men, men of God. Men that carry the vessels of God. Men that God can live in. Men that God would not hate. Men that God can love because there's so much of the love of God that has been shed in the hearts of these men or women by the Holy Spirit. I have one more last verse. Hebrews chapter 4. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharpening, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. <coughs> there is one verse that settles this whole matter concerning our personal conditions between us and God. It's the word of God. The word of God will settle all of this. The word of God is quick, means life-giving and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces even to dividing asunder of the soul and spirit. 
The sole power of a man that has ruled the man needs to be divided away, pulled away with a knifing from the Word of God so that the spirit stands separate within man than does his soul. And then man can receive the things of the Spirit of God. And that's often the problem. It is our natural reasoning powers that we use to try to receive and understand the ways and things of God. But it's our natural mind trying to discern that or trying to do that. It doesn't work that way. The natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They cannot. Natural man, if I am a natural man, I cannot, I will not, I never will, and never shall receive anything from the Spirit of God. So the challenge is somehow my soul and spirit need to be divided. I looked at it years ago. I've made this statement that when Adam and Eve were in the garden, it was like the antenna that went up, like I spoke about earlier, that was up there because God spoke to that antenna and said that do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was a tree of knowledge. That's what it was. It was the tree of knowledge, reason, understanding. Do not eat of that one. But when the serpent came, the serpent spoke to Adam and Eve's ears and eyes and said, ah, are you sure? Did God say that? Look at this tree. What can it do? It looks so innocent. Just eat of a fruit. It sounded reasonable. And Adam and Eve started reasoning, or Eve did. She reasoned that, okay, I'm going to risk it. And when she reasoned, that soul power sprung into being and the spirit of man went dormant. Now what it is telling us here that those two need to stay separated. The spirit of man, the soul of man, which is emotion, will, and intellect. The spirit of man and the soul of man need to stay separated. And there's only one thing that can separate that. It's the word of God. The word of God. What does the Bible say? That's what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? The Bible is life-giving. It's quick. It's powerful. It divides this from this. Yeah, but I don't think it... It doesn't matter what you think. That stays divided. Only when these two are divided, then you can receive the things of God. There's another way of explaining this. The cross right here. The cross of Jesus. If you want to follow Christ, you have to take up the cross and follow. There is a cross demand to keep these two separated. Because Jesus, that is the word of God, had to die and resurrect. So that we have the power to separate these two by the power of the word of God. That's exactly what he did when he was on the cross again. So the cross is something you and I have to take up voluntarily all the time. We take it up daily. If not, you'll start getting confusion. And it's this stuff that comes into your mind. Next thing that happens, you'll have a root of bitterness that will try to defile you. And then that will defile many others as well. And there you are. You wondered where all you went. Why is God not close to me? That's what happened. The cross of Jesus Christ separates these two. That's the word of God. The unquestionable Word of God. The one that you cannot deny. The one that you cannot walk from. The principal Word of God that stands and not one jot or tittle will ever vanish away. The Word of God will always stand. That Word of God needs to be applied. There is where it stands. And when you have the Word of God in obedience to your own heart and you live by it, you walk by it, and you feed by it, there's a distinct difference. The soul man has no choice but to surrender. It has no more suggestions to suggest that I'll do things this way and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that like Esau did. And I guess if I can conclude this, I would say that what God cannot love, what God cannot love is what Esau did. Man's own way. He cannot love man's own way, which is sin. God cannot love your sin. He loves you. He cannot love your sin. 
So if you want, or if you questioned why you haven't gone deeper with God, that's part of, if not the main problem. But let's never allow ourselves to come to a place where God would actually say that he hates our ways. There's whole categories of that yet in the Bible, that he hates. I hate your ways. If God, the creator, the, 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 there's no higher authority than God, would say that about a measly little person, what a tragic condition that would be. Let's stand to our feet. Close prayer.